It was not a telephone call that I'd been expecting. Who would have thought that my favorite contemporary Christian musician, one of the most popular composers in the whole evangelical world, would be calling me one afternoon? Ten years earlier, I had been part of his world as an evangelical pastor. But my conversion into the Catholic faith back in 86 left me sort of persona non grata to all of those folks. So why on earth would Rich Mullins be calling me? His song, Awesome God, was one of my all-time favorites, a blockbuster back in the 80s, and we were singing it still here at Franciscan University where I was teaching. He had performed once or twice. He had come back to be on a retreat, a kind of personal and private retreat. But why was he calling me? That's what I didn't understand. Well, he was calling me because, as he explained, he had become increasingly convinced of the truth of the Catholic faith. He wanted a theologian, he said, to respond to some of his questions. And since I had walked that walk, we ended up talking for more than a half an hour. He told me his story. He had been raised Quaker in a very anti-doctrinal tradition, but then in college, he had joined a restorationist church whose slogan was, no creed, but Christ. But then studying scripture and Christian history, it dawned on him, which Christ? Was it the Docetists? Was it the Arian Christ? Was it the Adoptionists? Was it the Monophysite Christ? Or was it the Christ of the Creed? Or today, he said, is it the Christ of the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the revolutionary Jesus, or Jesus the guru of the New Age? So he had written a song that had already become one of my favorites, simply entitled Creed, but in that conversation he admitted to me that all of these different heresies, all of these rival denominations left him deeply troubled. And so he was looking for the gospel in its fullness, which gospel was true, and he began to discover more and more that there was really no way to know Jesus and to love him apart from the word of God and through the creed. He went on to say that he had also read a number of Catholic authors, including us. He had gone through Rome's sweet home, and my estimation of him began to increase even more. But to imagine that he would track down a theologian and call me on the phone. Shortly afterwards, he went back and told me that uh, he was an RCIA. Tragically, as many of you know, he died less than a year later, on the 19th of September in 1997. On his way to Wichita, where he was planning to be received into the Catholic Church, our Lord just said, don't bother, come on up here and join us in the liturgy. But what he shared with me changed my life, even though I was a Catholic, because it reinforced my own sense that we have received a legacy through the liturgy that is life-giving. And in his song, Creed, he says, and I quote, and I believe what I believe is what makes me what I am. I didn't make it. No, it is making me. It is the very truth of God and not the invention of any man. I believe, I believe, and we do too. But sometimes I'm convinced that we don't fully appreciate the creed. Some people say we recite it too much. I say no, we ponder it too little. But when we do ponder it more, when we begin to contemplate it, we're going to see what it is. And I believe, like so many other things that cradle Catholics have grown up with, and even converts grow to take for granted, this is a precious treasure. In fact, that is precisely what St. Ambrose calls it. The Catechism quotes this great 4th century Archbishop of Milan who was instrumental in the conversion of St. Augustine through his preaching and teaching, but also through his proclamation of the Creed. Ambrose said, and I quote, the Creed is the spiritual seal, our heart's meditation, an ever-present guardian it is unquestionably the treasure of our soul, close quote. Hence the title of this evening's presentation, The Treasure of Our Soul. 
I want us to go back and sort of blow off the dust from the creed and recognize it's something even greater than if we found the hope diamond in our living room in the corner. This is what gives us supernatural hope that we are beloved children of God. Also, back in the fourth century, not in Milan, but in Jerusalem, the Bishop of Jerusalem, St. Cyril, said the following, this synthesis of faith was not made to accord with human opinions, but rather what was of the greatest importance was gathered from all the scriptures to present the one teaching of the faith in its entirety. And just as the mustard seed contains a great number of branches and a tiny grain, so too this summary of faith encompasses in a few words the whole knowledge of the true religion contained in both the Old and the New Testaments, close quote. Both of those quotations are found in the Catechism, in paragraph 197 for Ambrose and in paragraph 186 for St. Cyril of Jerusalem. And I give you those references so that you can look them up because that part of the Catechism, like so many other sections, is also inexhaustible. It's rich, it's beautiful, it's true, it's powerful. Back in the ancient church, the Apostles' Creed was referred to as a symbolon, that is, a symbol. But back then, symbolon meant more than symbol. It referred to half of a broken object, a seal that was divided in two, and it was a token of recognition. The broken parts were meant to be placed together to verify the identity of the bearer, to validate his identity. And I would propose that it still functions that way. When we recite the creed and mean what we say and say what we mean, then we are two halves made whole. God and humanity are united. Besides being a symbol, we know that the creed is also an authoritative summary of Christianity's basic beliefs. But as St. Cyril indicates, it's also a synthesis of the Bible. How appropriate it is then, from the first millennium until today, what do we find? We find ourselves standing up after the reading of scripture, after the homily. We stand up, why? To get the blood circulating, right? It's like a seventh inning stretch. No, we stand up to state this solemn pledge, which summarizes our faith, which synthesizes the readings of scripture from the old and the new, which we've just heard, knowing, as we've heard, that the new is concealed in the old and the old is revealed in the new. But even if Father's homily wasn't reminiscent of St. Ambrose or St. Augustine, even if it led us to fight sleep, nevertheless, we stand up and proclaim the faith with a clarity and a cogency that is nothing less than a covenant renewal. In fact, every Sunday, the creed is intended to be the climax of the liturgy of the word what we call the first half of the Mass. It is analogous to what we do in the climax of the second half of the Mass, and which is what? Holy Communion. When we receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, the two halves come together. The symbolon is complete. It's not just a summary of doctrine. It's not just a synthesis of Scripture. It is a solemn pledge of ourselves to Christ. This is why the Catechism indicates that our faith does not rest ultimately in doctrinal propositions, but rather in the realities that those formulas convey. And so we don't put our faith in the 12 articles of the creed, but we do put our faith in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Persons, not propositions. But far from devaluing propositions, these three divine persons that give us the threefold structure of the creed also give to us entrance into the inner life of this divine family. They give to us new birth. They give to us our true and eternal identity. And so sometimes we go forward and suddenly hear unexpectedly body of Christ. Oh yeah, amen. Suddenly we might be hearing ourselves called to recite the creed. In both cases, we are children in a family. And God the Father understands that sometimes his children are weak and wayward. Sometimes they're distracted. 
Sometimes they forget, but he never does. And so he binds himself to us, and he calls us to bind ourselves to him. This is what makes Christianity so unique. It's what also makes it the full flowering of Judaism. I wrote a book years ago entitled Kinship by Covenant, and I asked a, a famous scholar, David Noel Friedman, a Jewish scholar, to write the foreword. Because in the foreword, near the end of his life, it's the last thing he ever wrote that I know of, he actually confesses that he has seen in the Bible that Jesus is the Christ. But he also noticed years earlier something that drew my attention. He said, and I quote, that when you study the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, for him as a Jew, and the ancient Near Eastern background, he says, quote, there are no convincing parallels in the pagan world where you find a God binding himself to his people. God binding Israel to serve him or in the more unusual position of God binding himself by oath to the service of his own servants, close quote. This is the full flowering of the Bible, but it's like a seed that was planted in the Old Testament. The Jews had a much shorter creed. It was called the Shema. We find it in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. We know that well. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. But the word for one in Hebrew there is not one in the sense of solitary, but one in the sense of unitary. That is, it's the same term found in Genesis 2, where the two become one flesh. So already in the Old Covenant, there was a monotheistic commitment, but also a Trinitarian mystery planet waiting to sprout, but awaiting the fullness of time when God the Father would send his Son. In the Old Testament, there in Genesis 1, we hear God referred to as Elohim. That's the generic name for God, the deity. But after the seventh day, which he consecrates, which he blesses, upon which he rests, the Sabbath, which is the sign of the covenant, suddenly in Genesis 2, his name changes to what? Yahweh Elohim. Again and again, we hear the personal name of the Lord of the covenant, which is Yahweh which is translated Lord with all four caps. Whenever you see that, you know that's the Hebrew tetragrammaton. And so we find in the Old Testament that God is faithful, that God is merciful. But we also find that he is called God, Elohim, over 2,600 times. Whereas he's referred to as Lord, Yahweh, over 7,000 times. And he's referred to as Father, a grand total of 17 times. Now, don't get me wrong, 17 is significant, but in contrast to 2,600 or 7,000, it's paltry. And so in the Old Testament, we worship the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In the Old Testament, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He provides for his sheep, the sheep of his pasture. We're his flock, and he provides for us better than fathers and mothers do for their kids, but he's the shepherd, he's not the sheep. But when the new fulfills the old, when the shepherd suddenly decides to make his grand entrance into human history as the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world, guess what? The new doesn't simply fulfill the old, it surpasses it. The fulfillment of the old by Christ coming in the new exceeds the highest hopes, the wildest dreams of the holiest Jews. And you can tell, because in Jesus' first discourse, I like to point out the Sermon on the Mount, he refers to God as Father. How many times? 17. The rabbis total up the number of references to God as Father in the Hebrew Bible, it's 17. In Jesus' first discourse, it's 17. And at the center of that sermon is the Our Father, where he trained his disciples to pray in a way that not even the high priest in the Jerusalem temple ever dared to address the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But we dare to say, our Father who art in heaven, because he has sent his Son. 
And so he refers to God as Father more than 170 times in the Gospels, never refers to him by any other name. And in his last discourse, the farewell discourse that we find in the concluding chapters of John 14 through 17, he refers to God as Father even more. How many times? 51 times. That's 3 times 17. And he also refers to the mystery that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. He doesn't say no one comes to the deity but by me because they've been coming to the deity ever since creation. Because the creation shows all of the signs of the power and the intelligence of the creator. But no one comes to the Father but by me because nobody knew that God was a father until he sent his son. So he is the way to God precisely as father. He is the truth about God because whoever God is, it's not reducible to him creating the world. From all eternity, God exists, but only in the beginning did the world come into existence. And so the truth about God is not reducible to the creator, the lawgiver, the Lord, the judge. The truth about God is father. He's an eternal father. That's why the son isn't younger or smaller. He's God from God, light from light, true God from true, because he's eternally begotten, not made from all eternity. This is the mystery that Christ has come to give to us. He is the way, the truth, and the life because that's what a father gives when he generates a son. He gives the fullness of his nature. And that's what Jesus possesses from all eternity. But he comes to us to share it, to show a divine passion that exceeds anything we find in the Old Testament. And this is what we have sometimes come to take for granted. And yet when Jesus made his incarnational debut, it wasn't like all eyes on me, I am the eternal deity, I am the eternal son. No, in the Gospels he refers to himself not as son of God, but what? Son of man, 82 times, more than all the other titles combined. And he's the only one who ever refers to himself as the son of man. And you can classify his usage in three senses. On the one hand, he speaks of how the son of man has power over nature, performing miracles, casting out demons. But in the second case, he also speaks of how the son of man will be rejected and hand it over unto death. And then, of course, we have the Son of Man in the third class, and that is where the Son of Man will be riding on the clouds of heaven, coming to the Ancient of Days in glory, because Son of Man is taken straight out of Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. So he didn't come to brag about his own eternal prerogatives. The the Divine Father sent the Divine Son to enter into solidarity with us. Not to show off, but to give off the radiance of his own divine sonship. He assumed what is ours in order to impart what is his. He takes on human sonship in order to empower us to share divine sonship. So the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is now the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the structure of the creed. 12 articles of which we trace all the way back to the first century. St. Ambrose and Rufinus of Aquila, two fourth century figures. These two fathers of the early church indicate that before the apostles were sent out to the four corners to proclaim the gospel to all nations, they gathered together one last time. This was after Pentecost. This was in order to kind of identify what it was the core of belief that we would have, and the creed was the result. And so Peter goes first, I believe in God the Father, and then Andrew goes next, and all the way down to Matthias, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Now, whether we can demonstrate that through historical documents is sort of beside the point. But the fact is, the earliest form of the creed is precisely how people entered into a baptismal covenant. Already in 215 AD, Hippolytus of Rome is describing the threefold baptism. And the oldest form was not a declarative creed like I believe in God the Father, but an interrogative creed, question and answer like we hear at the Easter Vigil. 
do you believe in God the Father? I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only son? And as you confess the I do believe in God the Father, you are immersed once. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and you go through the second part of the creed, and then you're dunked a second time. And then a third time, do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion, and then the third and final time. Because you aren't just washed from sin, you are regenerated. You are divinely rebirthed into the family of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is who we are. This is what we do. And this is what the creed means to us. And this is the key that I believe will unlock for us the new evangelization. We recognize we're smack dab in the middle of the great jubilee of divine mercy. But all of that is situated against the background of the new evangelization. Now I know in previous conferences I have spoke on the new evangelization, so I won't take that tangent, which is a real unusual thing for me. But we know what the new evangelization is because John Paul called for it and he clarified it again and again hundreds of times. It's about re-evangelizing the dechristianized. And I am convinced that the creed is really the key for all of this. Earlier this month I was out in California and I had a few minutes with Pastor Rick Warren and we were able to connect and then we were texting afterwards but we were also reminiscing about the time that we shared last year in Philadelphia at the World Meeting of Families, where over 20,000 Christians met, mostly Catholic, and then of course at the climax there in Philadelphia, Pope Francis himself came. I got to speak and then I also got to introduce Pastor Rick Warren, the Saddleback in Southern California, the author of The Purpose Driven Life, which has sold, I think, more than 10 million copies. I think he was the only non-Catholic on the docket. And so before I introduced him, I got to talking to him backstage, and I told him how much I got out of his book, and he told me how much he got out of my books, and he began to tick off the list, Lamb Supper, Joy to the World. Lord have mercy on my estimation of him began to soar as well. <laughs> I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. <laughs> oh, you wouldn't believe how humble I am. <laughs> not. <laughs> but when he got up to speak, he blew us away because he called us as Catholics to recognize that John Paul had given to us not only our marching orders, but the thing that all Christians needed, the thing that the world needed, and that was the new evangelization. And he spoke about the creed, he spoke about prayer, he spoke about the Our Father, and he recognized just how dire the need is for our culture today, and then suddenly he went down a litany. Not the litany of Loretta, which is my personal favorite, but his own litany of why the new evangelization is so needed. With his permission, I'm going to read to you what he said to us. He said, in today, today's society, materialism is idolized. Immorality is glamorized, truth is minimized, sin is normalized, divorce is rationalized, and abortion is legalized. On the internet and TV and movies, crime is legitimized, drug use is minimized, comedy is vulgarized, and sex is trivialized. Meanwhile, the Bible is fictionalized, churches are satirized, God is marginalized, and Christians are demonized. The elderly are dehumanized, the sick are euthanized, the poor are victimized, the mentally ill are ostracized, and our children are tranquilized. Even in our families, our manners are uncivilized, our speech is vulgarized, faith is secularized, and everything is commercialized. Too often, he said, as Christians, we are disorganized, our pastors are demoralized, our faith is compartmentalized, and so our witness is compromised. What do we need? We need our worship to be revitalized, our differences to be minimized, our members to be mobilized, our marriages to be re-energized, the lost to be evangelized, and every one of us to be re-evangelized. And we sat there mesmerized. <laughs> but there it was, a challenge to us as Catholic Christians and also an expression of gratitude for the church and our tradition, the creed, the liturgy, all of these things. 
I am convinced that it can do today what it did back then in the first, second, third, and fourth centuries. I know we probably have a fair number of Irish Catholics here. Can I see a show of hands? So you're familiar with St. Patrick, perhaps. Well, we all are, right? St. Patrick, I was just reading last week his confessions as well as this letter to Caroticus. And it was interesting to me because I didn't know, or I'd forgotten that the confession of St. Patrick begins, I, Patrick, a sinner, the rudest and least of all the faithful and most contemptible. And why? Because he was taken captive when he was 16, but he describes how beforehand he had a father, Calpornus, who was a deacon. So he had been reared in the faith and then he rejected it. So he was taken captive when he was nearly 16, brought captive to Ireland. Why? Because we had forsaken God. We had not kept his commandments. We were disobedient to our priests. And so the Lord brought down the anger of his punishment and scattered us. The Lord showed me my disbelief that I might remember my iniquities. And yet the Lord God looked down upon my humiliation with pity, with mercy, and strengthened me as a father would his son. Therefore, I cannot and ought not to be silent concerning the great benefits and graces which the Lord bestowed upon me in the land of my captivity, since the only return we can make for such benefits is to confess his wonders before every nation. And so how does he begin to confess God's wonderful mercy? For there is no other God except the Lord, the unbegotten Father, by whom all things were made, and his Son, Jesus Christ, whom together with the Father we testify to have existed before the origin of the world spiritually with the Father. He was made man. Death was overthrown. He is the Lord. He is coming again to judge the living and the, and the dead. He will render to everyone according to his works. He basically just goes down the 12 articles of the creed, which he had learned as a child from his deacon father, but he had spurned. And so what was it that the Lord used to reawaken his faith? Simply going back and realizing that he had come to take for granted the mysteries of eternity, these countless graces. And so God poured forth abundantly on us the gift of the Spirit, the pledge of immor immortality to become sons of God again, co-heirs with Christ, whom we confess and adore, one God in the Trinity. This is not just a three-leaf clover he was passing out. And not only was that the way he was reawakened, the way he confessed his repentance and his return to God's family, you'll discover in the letter, this is also how he evangelized. He came to a royal home of the McNeils, and the two daughters of the McNeils questioned Patrick, who is your God? Tell us plainly how we shall see him. How is he to be loved? How is he to be found? St. Patrick, full of the Holy Spirit, responded, our God is the God of all, the creator of heaven and earth, and he is a son, co-eternal and co-equal with himself, and the Son is not younger than the Father, nor is the Father older than the Son. And the Holy Spirit breathed forth in them. And the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are not divided. I desire moreover to unite you to the Son of the Heavenly King, for you are daughters of an earthly king. And so he went down the articles of the creed, and the daughters said, Teach us truly then, that we may see the face of the Lord. And then Patrick said, do you believe that through baptism you will have the forgiveness of sins? We believe. And so they were baptized after he had gone through every single one of the 12 articles of the creed. And then they received the body of Christ and his blood. See, that's the way he was re-evangelized, even though he had wandered. That's the way he transformed this island that we call Ireland into a island. An, you know, an island of saints and scholars. I would say it this way. If God could do it back then against all odds, with all kinds of challenges, there's no reason to think that he can't do it again. He can, and he wants to if we let him, if we say yes from the heart sincerely to this solemn pledge of the creed, this great symbolon, this great summary of our beliefs, this great synthesis of Scripture, but when we hear it at the Easter Vigil and we're reminded of the baptismal covenant, 
Do you reject Satan and all of his pomps? I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I do. Keep listening because you keep saying, I do, I do, just like Kimberly said, I do, just like I said, I do, and we did. And we entered into a covenant. And if that's true in the natural family of the Hans, it's even truer in the supernatural family of God that is the Catholic Church, that is our true identity. And so when we come to the creed, I've been focusing in the Apostles' Creed, which is traceable back to the first century. We could look also at the Nicene Creed, which is there in the fourth century, which was expanded because of the heresies of Arius, of Macedonius, the Arians, the semi-Arians, the, Mas the new Matamachians, all of them. And so the church had to clarify, what do we really believe when we call God Father, when we refer to Jesus as Son? Because other religions had language of Father, Son, but it was always figurative. It was merely a metaphor. But is it anything more than that? Oh, yes, it is. And so homoousios, consubstantial with the Father, is how the church validates its understanding of the Gospels. It also shows us that God's fatherhood is not a figure of speech but a reality. That Jesus' sonship is not metaphorical but metaphysical. And this is the key that unlocks it all. Because the love of the Father for the Son is the same as the love of the Son for the Father. And that love is a gift of life that proceeds eternally from the Father to the Son and from the Son back to the Father. And it's not a what, it's a who, it's the Holy Spirit. And it's what the Father sent the Son to give us there at the cross where we discover not just pain, but passion. We see not just injustice and violence, we see love and mercy. He's not losing his life at Calvary. He's freely giving it to us through his mother. As we heard in the liturgy earlier from Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel, is that the woman and her seed will crush the head of the serpent, pointing forward to the new Eve, who will bring the forth the new Adam. And so no wonder Jesus says, woman, there in John 19, verse 24. Behold your son. And then to the beloved disciple, behold your mother. And then he said, I thirst. Not because he hadn't noticed how thirsty he was until the last few moments of his life, but because he was thirsting for us more than we have ever thirsted for anything. This is what the creed is. This is what each and every article leads to like rungs in a ladder by which we ascend to see the face of God the Father and recognize the passion of Jesus is still raging like a fire out of control for each of us. This is who we are. This is what we're called to be. This is also what we are called to share. And I am convinced that in the creed, we've got a choice to make. Because besides the three divine persons, there are only two human persons mentioned. And who are they? born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. There are the options, right? A man and a woman. But in this case, not complementary, but contradictory. Because suffering under Pontius Pilate, we see such a typical 21st century person, not just a politician, but we've heard so much this weekend about relativism. And he knows that Jesus is innocent. He knows that Jesus is something more than even his followers can see. But what does he do? He washes his hands. And then what does he declare? What is truth? A true relativist, a true cynic. And so his name is enshrined in ignominy and shame. And yet it's a temptation for every one of us to go along to get along. But he was born of the Virgin Mary. She is the one who will lead us to him. He is the one who gave her to us. Any man who will give his own mother to you is not about to withhold anything else. A man who comes to reveal his divinity and it declares, I am going to my father and your father. And then he turns around and entrusts his beloved mother to us through the power of the spirit. This is something that we will never quite exhaust. But I want to say to you that this is more than just true. It's more than just beautiful. It's also powerful. The Blessed Virgin Mary is the instrument of choice for God the Trinity to overcome all of the pilots who cause the suffering.
to save all of the sons and daughters who were adopted by grace. St. Louis de Montfort went so far as to say that Satan fears Mary more than God. Why? Because what is Satan's besetting sin? It's pride. And what attacks his pride more than anything else? It's not being defeated by God. What creature could stand up to the Almighty? But to be defeated by a human and not just a human, but by a woman? This is not only God's glory, but Satan's shame. And this is why God loves to use her more than all the powerful, all the intelligent, all of the popular. Because it takes out sin at its root, which is pride. And even those who won't repent will fear that sort of divine glory. But we've got nothing to fear. St. Louis de Montfort says Satan can't stand her. Why? Because, as he puts it, Satan being proud suffers infinitely more from being beaten and punished by a little and humble handmaid of God, and her humility humbles him more than God's divine power. And not just back then, but now. Not just for Jesus and the beloved disciple, but for all of us as beloved disciples. He thirsts for us. I've been going through this covenant renewal once again with a, a good friend of mine, a former student who's now become my teacher and spiritual guide, Father Michael Gately. I'm always mentioning this, 33 days to morning glory. I'm going through it now for the ninth or tenth time. But we just passed day 16, and I want to read to you from soon-to-be Saint Teresa of Calcutta, because you'll recall how way back, some 70 years ago, in 1946, on September 10th, she had this call within a call where the Lord called her to share his thirst and to share the Blessed Virgin who there at the foot of the cross understood his thirst like no one else. And so she kept it a secret. She would share it with her own missionaries at charity so that in every chapel you will see I thirst, but not until John Paul gave a meditation in 1993, did she finally realize it was time to disclose this secret, this mystery, this beauty? She writes, the Holy Father's letter is a sign. The time has come for me to speak openly of the gift that God gave me. Jesus wants me to tell you again how much love he has for each one of you, beyond all you can imagine. I worry, she writes, that some of you have not really met Jesus, one-to-one, -one, you and him alone. We may spend time in the chapel, but have you seen with the eyes of your soul how he looks at you with love? Do you really know the living Jesus, not from books only, but from being with him in your heart? Ask for the grace. He is longing to give it to you. And never give up this daily intimate contact with him as the real living person, not just a proposition, not just the idea. How can we last even one day without hearing Jesus say, I love you? Impossible, she writes. Our soul needs that as much as the body needs to breathe. If not, prayer is dead. Meditation, only thinking. I find this deeply convicting. I am sharing it to you, but for me. She continues, be careful of all that can block that personal contact with the living Jesus. The devil will try to use the hearts of life, your own mistakes, to make you feel that it's impossible that Jesus really loves you. This is a danger for all of us, and so sad, because it's the complete opposite of what Jesus really wants. Not only that he loves you, but even more, he longs for you. He misses you when you don't come close. He thirsts for you. He loves you always, even when you don't feel worthy, especially then. He is the one who always accepts you. My children, you don't have to be different for him to love you. Only believe that you are precious to him. Bring all your suffering to his feet. Open your heart to be loved by him as you are, and he will do the rest. But you must hear him say, I thirst. Jesus himself must be the one to say to you, I thirst. Now, I want to just stop for a moment and reflect upon this because as an academic, I kind of wonder, really? I thirst? I mean, I know what thirst is. I know what hunger is. 
When I'm thirsty, I go get a drink. And when I'm done, I'm not thirsty anymore. When I'm hungry, I go eat and my appetite is satisfied. But how is it that Jesus thirsts? How is it that God thirsts? It isn't as though Jesus says, I thirst, and then he just gets a drink, and oh, that's, that's really all. No. His human thirst is an image of a divine thirst that is infinite. It's not because he's thirsty, then when he just, you know, takes a drink, he's not thirsting anymore. His thirst is infinite. It is, in effect, beyond our capacity to satisfy. He doesn't get anything out of us that he was missing before. So why do you thirst? Because his love is a passion that brought us into existence out of nothing. He is the creator of heaven and earth. But he didn't just bring it into existence out of nothing to show off. He brought us all into existence to give off the radiance of his own sonship, his own life, his own love. He thirsts for us infinitely more than we have ever known thirst. He thirsted so much he brought us into existence out of nothing. And he has thirsted to bring us to this moment, to this place, to this conference, to this night, to this talk, but even more, to the blessed sacrament in just a little while. Because he loves us, and his love is out of control. It is not measurable by any finite means. She concludes, Mother Teresa does, not just once, but every day. Why does Jesus say, I thirst? What does it mean? It's hard to explain in words. I thirst is something much deeper than Jesus just saying, I love you. Until you know deep inside that he thirsts for you, you can't begin to know who he wants to be for you or who he wants you to be for him. But because Our Lady was there at Calvary, she knows how real, how deep is his longing for you and for the poor because she shares it. He knows your weakness. He wants only your love. Brothers and sisters, we are here, not just because we're thirsty, but because he is. He's not less thirsty than we are. He's immeasurably more. When we're thirsty, we take a drink and we're not thirsty anymore for a while. But he is thirsty for all eternity. He hungers and thirsts for us. Not in spite of the fact that we don't give him anything, but precisely because we don't add anything to his glory. He's not thirsting for more glory. He's thirsting to share that with each and every one of us. Because he is a perfect father who isn't threatened by the success of his children. He is glorified precisely, not in our groveling, but our coming to share in more and more of his grace, to enter into the fullness of his glory. And she who is the fullness of grace, even in the eyes of the archangel, she is our mother. And she longs to feed us, and she thirsts and hungers like he does. This isn't just pious rhetoric. If I could give to you a sort of Geiger counter as to the, the reality, the radioactivity, the power of his love, it would be off the charts. Now you'll have to take my word for it. When we all get to heaven, you'll look back and say, wow, it was much more than he said. Because it is. He binds himself to us by a covenant that is unprecedented in the history of salvation, in the history of world religions, and then he invites us to bind ourselves in our weakness to him. And this is because he's a perfect father who sends the son and the power of the spirit and trusts his mother to us. I'm reminded of a, a time years ago when we were downtown Pittsburgh where I'd grown up and we were going to see a Pirates game. We were crossing a, a busy street in rush hour. I think it was Liberty Avenue. And so as we got to the corner and as we saw the, the walk sign, I said to the kids, let's hold hands. And Kimberly at one end holding the boys and, and Hannah and me on the other end because I've got six kids but only one daughter. Five thorns, one rose. So I said, hold my hand tight, Hannah. And so she did. She was only about six or seven at the time. And as we crossed Liberty Avenue, suddenly, unexpectedly, around the corner came a pickup truck that didn't even bother to look. Right turn on red. I don't know what he was thinking, but he came barreling around the corner, headed straight for us. We saw him. She shrieked. And what did she do? She let go of my hand. Even though I had specifically asked her, I commanded her to hold fast, hold tight to my hand. So what did I do? 
I let go. You want to feel what a fender is like? No, I didn't. I squeezed tighter. I pulled her back. The truck raced by. She looked up at me and she said, Daddy, you're hurting me. I said, I don't want to hurt you. I didn't mean to. She said, look, it hurts. And sure enough, there was a red mark. I scooped her up when we got to the other side of the street. And I said, I didn't want to hurt you, but I had to. She didn't understand. She buried her face in my shoulder and cried. But I had to. The Lord binds himself to us in his strength, in his love, in his hunger for us. And then he asks us to enter into a covenant with him, to bind ourselves to him, to renew that covenant in every mass. Not only through receiving Holy Communion, but also renewing our covenant through the solemn pledge of the creed, where we recall what we became when we were baptized as children of God. But he knows that when we see a truck coming, when we have hardships, what are we going to do? We're going to let go. And what is he going to do? He's going to squeeze tighter. And it's going to hurt. But not because he stopped loving us, but because he can't stop. And so let's prepare our hearts to renew this covenant, to enter into a family bond that is not just human but divine, not just temporal but eternal, that is summed up in the threefold structure of the creed, synthesized in all the 12 articles. I love St. Bonaventure. He goes back to Joshua chapter 4 and how it was that Joshua commanded the, the Levites to, to carry the Ark of the Covenant down to the, the bank of the river and then suddenly the water of the Jordan did for Joshua what the Red Sea had done for Moses so that all 12 tribes could cross on dry ground. And then he commanded the Levites to take 12 stones and put them there in the middle of the riverbed. So when the river flowed back again, the stones would be covered, but the remembrance would be there. And then he commanded the 12 princes of the 12 tribes to take big stones on their shoulders and carry them to the west bank of the Jordan and stack them as a memorial of God's faithfulness. The 12 articles of the creed, St. Bonaventure says, are like these 12 stones that represent the 12 mysteries, the 12 apostles. And in fact, in Revelation 21, you'll see that the church, the bride of Christ to whom he said, I do, is the new Jerusalem built upon what? 12 foundation stones, which are the 12 apostles. The church is not just the wooden stage in which the drama of salvation history unfolds. The church is the drama. The church is the family that God is fathering. It is the body of Christ. It is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is our home forever. And so let God bind himself to you, even if it hurts, because of the countless times we give in to fear. And let's renew our covenant together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.